Well, meditation is, uh, in a way, it's simply le about learning how to be fully with your life. It's, uh, we think of meditation as, say, sitting down with our eyes closed and um, focusing our attention on our breath or walking backwards and forwards on a path, watching our, our footsteps. So those are what we would call formal meditation practices. But meditation is much broader and its purpose is much broader. So uh, many years ago, this uh, European uh, researcher came to visit Ajahn Chah, our teacher, in Wat uh, Nong in Ubon province. And uh, he was asking all these different gurus and meditation teachers you know, three questions. Yeah. Why do you meditate? How do you meditate? And what's the result of your meditation? And uh, Ajahn Chah, so was, he was quite amused by this sort of very serious intellectual approach. And uh, he kind of gave the researcher a bad time. But eventually, he, uh, he kind of teased him a bit uh, in his uh, uh, usual way. Um, but eventually, he, he said, uh, well, I want to ask you three questions in return. Why do you eat? How do you eat? And what's the result of having eaten? And uh, the, the researcher was, was offended. Like, what do you mean? Yeah. I may, I'm asking you a serious question and you're making fun of me. And Ajahn Chah said, no, 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 I'm not. I'm not. Because meditation is food for the heart, is food for the mind. And so you might think of meditation as some kind of optional extra to life. But if you really want to be alive, then you need to pay attention to your life. You need to be there for it. Uh, and meditation is simply um, showing up for your own life, paying attention to what you feel, what you think, uh, what, you, what you like, what you dislike, uh, your, uh, your relationships, your perceptions of the world, uh, the way you work, uh, all of this, uh, all these different dimensions of our existence. Meditation is about learning to watch, learning to listen, learning to see where the, uh, our, our mental habits create problems, attaching to like and dislike, uh, believing in opinions, um, following desires and fears and aversions in an unconscious way. The more that we pay attention to our life and our mind and how the mind functions with the world, the more we're able to live in tune with things. And this is, this is what we, you can call food for the heart or the, what really nourishes us as a human being. So he said to this, this gentleman, I'm not making fun of you. Yeah, well, not completely. <laughs> I'm not making fun of you. But it's, uh, I ask these questions because meditation is as essential to life, really, to being really alive, as food is for keeping the body alive. And the, the Buddha said, mindfulness is the path to the deathless, to the Amata Dhamma. Heedlessness is the path to death. The mindful never die. The heedless are as if dead already. So that's quite a strident thing to say, quite an emphatic, strong statement. And, and so people wonder, well, what does he mean? He say, if you're mindful, does it mean that your body's never going to die? But no. <laughs> what it means is, if you're mindful, if you're fully aware, then uh, the, the mind doesn't get identified with all of the risings and passings away, the beginnings and endings, the births and deaths, successes and failures, gains and losses, loves and hates. Uh, that the heart is, is open and is free in relationship to all of the comings and goings of life. So, in a sense, he said, the mindful do not die. He said, the mindful, uh, their hearts are open to all things. They're free from attachment to birth and death, as we would say in Buddhism. But they're free from attachment to being praised, being criticized, being, uh, being rich, being poor, uh, being happy or being unhappy. You know, if you're wise, you can feel, a, say, a strong sense of grief. Just yesterday, someone was asking this question at a Dhamma talk. You can feel, a, you can feel grief, say that your, your mother's died or your father's died. You can have tears running down your face, feeling the sadness of, of your mother dying, but you can be completely at peace at, at the same time. There's, it's a sad feeling, the tears are running, but you're absolutely okay. And 
to our thinking mind, you're like, well, that's impossible. Either you're really upset, like, oh, my mother's died, or you're really cold, like, I don't care. All sankharas arise and pass away, you know. But it's not. It's that the middle way is where the, the, we feel emotion, we feel happiness or excitement, we feel fear or uh, d like and dislike, we feel grief. But the heart is completely uh, uh, aware of them and unentangled in them and not identified with them. So that when um, we are, uh, say, developing mindfulness or, uh, or anyway, full m heartfulness or when the heart is full of the present moment, the mind is full of the present moment, then, as the Buddha put it, we're really alive. And then to say the heedless are as if dead already. And uh, the Thai word pramat means crazy, like drunk or crazy, pramat. That comes from the Pali pamada. So he said that those who are pamada are as if dead already. It's like your body might be breathing and you might be moving around. You might have a, a high-powered job. But if you're heedless, you're as good as dead. You're not really there for your own life. You're with someone, but you don't see them. You just see your own projections about them. Is the guy attractive? Is he not attractive? Is he rich? What can I get from him? What does he want to get from me? You know, am I more handsome than he is? Or is he more handsome than I am? You know, that you're not seeing the other person. You're filled with your own fears and projections. You know, even as a monk, you, know, you can have this kind of, is that person... Have they got a higher rank than me? Are they not? Are they, is their meditation better than mine? Or my meditation's better than him? I'm being interviewed by a TV program. I'm more special than that monk who's not being interviewed. Look at me. You know? Then if our mind is heedless and filled with self-centered thinking, then you're not really alive. You know, if you believe in those thoughts and invest in them, you're as good as dead, according to the Buddha's estimation. So uh, meditation then is um, we use the exercises like mindfulness of breathing, mindfulness of walking, metta bhavana, loving kindness meditation. Those are all say particular methods that we can use uh, in order to help bring our attention to the present moment. And then uh, vipassana, uh, loving kindness meditation helps us to have an attitude of what I, would, what I call radical acceptance, so that the heart is open to everything. It does not contend against anything. That you know, there's the, the heart of metta recognizes that everything belongs. Even that, that difficult person, they belong. That person who just um, took the best par uh, parking place in the, in the car park, and I have to go and drive around and around and around to find another parking place. Even that guy, <laughs> I can have loving kindness for. To have loving kindness for the pains in your body, or the, the um, uh, say, repetitive, obsessive thought. You can have loving kindness even for your own anger. Not that you like it, or that you are glad that it's there, but you recognize anger is part of nature, and obsessive thought is part of nature. Somebody's got to get the good parking space, why shouldn't it be that guy instead of me? Why not? You know, sometimes I get the good parking spaces, sometimes I don't. That's the way nature works. So loving kindness, metta, is to recognize everything belongs. Everything is part of nature, mental, physical. So metta bhavana helps us to develop that heart that is wide, broad, and uh, open. Then say, concentration practices, like uh, mindfulness of breathing, or the mantra buddho, or walking meditation, they help to train the attention to stay with the present moment. Also, mindfulness of the body that I was talking about before, that helps us to, to keep the attention trained in the present moment. And then vipassana meditation, which we, we call insight uh, meditation in English, that enables the mind to uh, explore the very nature of experience, how, say, the perception of this moment is put together. So in terms of vipassana insight, I would say right now there is sight, sound, I can see you, I can see the cameras, I can see the floor, the lights, uh, I hear the sound of my voice, the sound, 
there's the the purring of the air conditioner and there's the uh, <coughs> the uh, other sounds in the room the builders working next door i'm feeling relieved that they're not drilling like they were yesterday so there's the awareness of emotion and thinking uh, taste uh, smell touch this moment is put together in the mind you might say here we are sitting in Dhammaram on Sukhumvit Soiklang but uh, also this experience is happening in your mind in my mind my mind uh, puts together some sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, thinking, memory, imagination the language I speak it puts together the world in, in this particular way it takes these perceptions so vipassana helps us to recognize oh this perception uh, uh, that is uh, apparent here in this moment this is put together it's compounded uh, and this feeling of I as the experiencer that too is something that's put together that we are able to say there's seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking but also it helps us to recognize that well calling this me the monk speaking or me Ajahn Amaro speaking or this is my accent or my voice when you with Vipassana when you explore well I say this is mine but who's the me? what is that me that is the owner? what does that look like? that which experiences uh, a human body this human life is that human? is that a person? is the mind that, that is aware is awareness uh, uh, is it male? is it female? is it tall? is it short? is it English? is it Thai? is it American? does it have a shape? does it have any form at all? does form apply? so Vipassana helps us to explore the very structure of experience how the mind puts together its world moment by moment and then in seeing how things are put together it learns to uh, recognize them trains the mind to see the world in a different way because when we recognize that this, this is my version of the world it's not the world then if, if the more that's recognized here the more I recognize well of course other people are going to see things differently just because I see something and I say oh that's beautiful doesn't mean that somebody else will say the same thing when we, we don't see clearly, when, when there isn't wisdom then we believe our opinions and our thoughts so if I say that's beautiful and you say oh, no that's ugly then I just assume you're wrong or you're stupid you have bad taste <laughs> because if I think it, it must be right that's the way we work as human beings if I think it, it's true if somebody else thinks different, they're wrong if we have no wisdom, that's how we see the world and that uh, my nationality is the best my language is the best my favorite foods are really good and other people's foods are kind of weird and not as good so that's how we are when we're attached so vipassana meditation helps us to see well that's just a personal impression how could that be true for everyone? and the more we, we recognize what I experience is just my version of the world the more it helps us to have compassion kindness towards others because why should my version of the world be the only real one? why should this be the one reliable one? why should I be the one person whose opinions are all correct in, a, in accordance with reality? what about everybody else? so when we develop insight, wisdom it helps us to be more harmonious to fit in with other people because we are able to have uh, say respect and gratitude uh, for uh, what others do, what they contribute to have compassion uh, and to have kindness and uh, say to appreciate that the opinions, the views, the experiences of others are equally valid equally uh, say important uh, as my own so that in terms of the uh, uh, how can meditation help? <laughs> I would say it's uh, meditation that's based on mindfulness meditation that's based on living skillfully like living uh, according to the uh, say the humanitarian values values of honesty and respect what in Buddhism we would say the five precepts that uh, 
if meditation is based on the five precepts, uh, whether it's based on bringing attention to the present moment, and it's based on letting go of self-centered habits, then it's definitely going to be of benefit to a person's life. Whether they call themselves a Buddhist or not is immaterial. Like at Amaravati Monastery where I live in England, we have a weekly meditation class. We have uh, people, uh, Buddhist people, Christian people, Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, uh, people who are d determined to be not religious at all, but are very dedicated meditators. <laughs> like, I'm not a Buddhist, but you come here every week. You come here every week for 30 years. Yeah, but I'm not a Buddhist. <laughs> they don't want to identify with a label, but they love to practice meditation. So this, these kind of methods and these, developing these skills is really just, as a human being, helping us to show up for our own life and to be, uh, and the more we're able to, to show up, then the more we're able to be, um, say, engaged and, and able to use the capacities, the abilities that we have. The, uh, uh, in one of uh, the John Lennon songs, he said, uh, and he was misquoting Samuel Johnson from the, uh, 300 years ago, <laughs> But he said, life is something that happens while we're making other plans. So we often we miss our life because we're so busy planning for something else that we're going to do. So we miss this because we're so interested in that. And so we miss our own life because we're, we're busy either reminiscing about the past or planning the future. So the present is lost to us. And the present is the only place where we can really be fulfilled. It's the only place where we can be completely free and completely happy. So the more that we pay attention to the present, the more that we can be free and the more that we can be happy. Absolutely. And that's what so Ajahn Chah, would, he would ask people when say, they'd say, Oh, Lumpur, Lumpur, I haven't got time to meditate. I've got five kids and I have to work and the, the, and the animals he's looking after. You know, I've got no time to meditate. And he would say, do you have time to breathe? And they said, well, yeah, of course. They said, well, you've got time to meditate then. <laughs> so basically, if you're alive, then you have time to meditate. And what he would, he spent about 40 years explaining these principles. Uh, and I feel it's a very helpful teaching for the world. Obviously, I'm a bit biased, you know, he's my teacher. <laughs> but I do uh, uh, feel it's incredibly helpful because uh, what he's saying is that the skills of formal meditation, like uh, concentration exercises and developing vipassana, spending time in retreat or spending hours in a day doing formal meditation, that really is useful. Yeah, that does have a benefit. But it's like if you're learning a musical instrument, you spend a certain amount of time sitting on the piano just playing your scales, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. But you don't do that in order just to play the scales. You do that in order to develop the skills, so then you can play uh, you know, Schubert or Beethoven or, you know, or Mozart, Rachmaninoff or whoever. You know, you, you are, you're learning the skills so you can actually make music, your music. And so that you develop those skills through the formal exercises, but then you can apply them moment by moment. And so if you listen to Lumpur Chah's teachings or read his books, then over and over, he'll, he's, the way he's describing things is like keeping track of your uh, aramanas, the, the arom, the feelings. Just noticing when you're feeling excited, noticing when you're feeling depressed, noticing when, when someone praises you. And they say, oh, that interview was so good. Wow, you are absolutely the tops. That was great. And you go, oh. yeah. no, what's that feeling like when you get praised? The, the, as they say in English, the the feeling of the cat that got the cream, you know, that, that kind of, oh, yes, I like that. <laughs> or when you're criticized, like, when, and you're waiting for them to say, oh, that was a great interview, and they're all kind of busy with the wires and the cameras, and no one's saying anything, and they think, oh, they didn't like my interview. And you say, so uh, how did that go? Oh, oh, dear, I failed. Oh, they didn't like it. They, oh, I was useless. Ah, oh, that's terrible. I feel awful. What does that feel like? So that you're, you're learning to, to, be, to be mindful of the flow of moods. Liking, disliking, 
being praised, being criticized, gaining, losing, happiness, unhappiness, and the, uh, throughout the, the process of the day, whether you're engaged in action, when you're, you're, you're watching how you do things. Do you start very quickly and then get tired and give up? Do you start slowly and carry on to the end? Do you uh, arrive early and set up for yourself and other people, tidy up after everyone else at the end? Do you show up late and expect everyone else to have set it all up for you? <laughs> Let someone else clean up after you? How do, how do you do it? How do you operate? So you're being observant for your own life. And oh, look at that. I always expect everyone else to set it up for me. Huh, look at that. I'm 30 years old and I only just noticed that. <laughs> or, or, yeah, I'm always setting things up for everyone else and I'm always tidying up. Why am I always the last one tidying up at the end? How come it's always me? Huh, 30, I've been here for 30 years and I've only just noticed I'm always tidying up, tidying up after everyone else. Huh, look at that. So that uh, meditation then becomes getting to know your own life, then the people around you, the, uh, the learning to recognize their characters, learning to be uh, attentive to the group that you're talking to, the, the group that you work with, the company you're a part of, uh, to be um, learning to know what's the right amount, okay, when in terms of the time you spend on something, or the amount of food to eat, or uh, what, uh, if you spend too much time on video games, then what, what's your brain like for the next day? <laughs> what, what, uh, what's the right amount? Okay. Let's say a couple of hours of video games is, is fine, but if I spend five hours or six hours, I'm fried for the next day. Okay, so the right amount, the matanyuta is, okay, a couple of hours, that works. With food, you know, with the time you spend with others, the time you spend alone. So these kind of... Um, uh, say, skills to develop as a, a well-rounded person, that all comes from watching your mind, being observant, learning to, to see how things work. So in that respect, meditation never has to stop. And so the, the exercises of, of uh, say, watching your, your breath or uh, doing chonkrom, walking up and down meditation, they help to sharpen the, the attention. But its main use is working with your, uh, your, uh, your kind of uh, partners in the film company or uh, with your family out on the street, dealing with the other people on the sky train, you know, that, that, that is really where we use the, the practice. And then we realize that, as Lumpur Cha again would say, you can suffer in every posture, therefore you can practice in every posture. <laughs> Whether you're sitting, standing, walking or lying down, you can still make problems for yourself. Therefore, you can also solve those problems even when you're sitting, standing, walking or lying down. 